So our next guest speaker is uh, Amy Herr, and uh, it's she is the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Professor in the Department of Bioengineering at UC Berkeley. Prior to becoming a professor, she worked in Sandia National Labs as a staff member, where she developed immunoaffinity methods for protein detection in biological fluids, such as serum and saliva, and also studied signaling cascades in sing single cells. In 2020, last year, Professor Herr has importantly contributed to a scientific consortium that is involved in researching how to effectively decontaminate N95 masks as part of the effort to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. Among her numerous awards and appointments, she is not only known for her outstanding research, but also for her mentorship of students and for her entrepreneurship. She co-founded Zephyrus Biosciences, a startup company that commercialized protein analysis at the single cell level. Their product was an instrument that performs single cell Western blots, which is quite a feat. Their company was actually uh, uh, bought out by biotech. In her lab, Professor Herr continues to develop microfluidics technologies that can profile proteins in complex mixtures in a rapid manner, including protein identifications from a single cell. I'd like to hand it over to you, Amy, so that we can learn more about these novel microfluidic tools that your lab is developing. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I just want to check to make sure that number one, you can see my slides and number two, that you can hear me. Could you just give me a thumb? Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Everything works. Perfect, thank you. Thank you and welcome everyone. It's an honor to virtually be here. Uh, of course, I wish I was with all of us um, in the auditorium that I can see tiny on the side of my screen. I really wanna thank the organizers for pioneering this new hybrid format as a way to bring us together, those of us who can be together in person, and of course, many, many of us who are dialing in from remote places. So thank you so much. I know that has taken a lot of work and a lot of thought. I am doing something like that for the Microtask Conference held October of this year uh, around microfluidics. Uh, we have about 1,100 attendees, about two thirds remote and one third in person. If you're interested, please take a look. Uh, today, I want to dig into some engineering and chemistry. I'm going to give you a pretty deep dive into a set of technologies that we've been designing and deploying for measurements that I think are somewhat neglected and quite complementary to the last talk that you've heard. Um, I will give two vignettes of projects that we've been working on. One, to share with you uh, our approach uh, to designing and developing new tools uh, so I'm a bioengineer and mechanical engineer by training. So that is the focus of the research I'll talk about today. And then also to potentially uh, stimulate questions or thoughts um, or possible connections between the work that you're uh, pursuing and the work that's happening in my group. So hopefully um, we'll meet those two goals um, as we walk through the short presentation today. So what I'm gonna talk about is really tools, tool sets, to measure cellular to molecular heterogeneity. And for us, that means with precision microfluidics, uh, an area that we've focused on um, over the past couple of years has really been around, uh, again, this gap that you heard mentioned in the previous talk, uh, but I think could benefit from a tremendous upswell in new high specificity tools. And that are questions, and those are questions that really involve the highly specific measurement of different proteoforms. I'll walk through um, essentially what that means. So when we think about cellular heterogeneity, we know that cell-to-cell -cell variation is important for disease, uh, understanding disease progression and life processes. We also know that molecular heterogeneity is important. Oftentimes we think about single cell tools and just the tremendous advances um, that tools specifically focused on uh, direct measurement of DNA and RNA are bringing both to our understanding of biology and biomedicine, but also really to the way that we ask questions. Um, I have to say that those tools obviously are quite powerful and have opened new doors and will continue to do so. Um, but I do want to remind you, even beyond what we've been thinking about this morning, uh, that there is an entire constellation of molecules that are out there, proteins, that exist in what I consider to be a combinatorial explosion of different states. Um, so specifically, I'm talking about uh, proteins, their different isoforms, the different site-specific features. Uh, key among these are things like post-translational modifications, um, of which there are upwards of hundreds, if not thousands of modifications that occur um, in biological systems. And then very, very importantly, 
this combinatorial explosion, as I call it, of a combination of each of these. Um, so the way that the different isoforms, site-specific features, uh, changes in conformation can all be reflected in the specific function of a specific protein molecule as it exists uh, in nature. So when we talk about proteoforms, and there's a, a really nice set of articles that introduce this more blanket concept, this more umbrella concept, um, extending beyond the concept of protein isoforms. Um, and the key reference I provide right here for you if you're interested. Uh, but when we think about these molecules, we, we know that to get the selectivity we need, the use of antibody probes is just alone, is just not going to cut it. Um, and that's because estimates of the number of proteoforms that exist um, span anywhere from 10 to the sixth to 10 to the ninth different unique molecular species. So even if we could generate affinity reagents for each of those species um, or species of interest, thinking about generating on that scale, well, potentially possible, um, I'm not gonna wait for it, uh, potentially possible is daunting uh, to say the least. And so I would urge you, if you are thinking about ways to help advance uh, single cell understanding of biology um, and biomedicine, that thinking about some of these targets um, that are quite literally blind spots to the tools that exist today, not measurable at the DNA level, not measurable at the mRNA level, and certainly not measurable with exi many existing of the immune reagents that are out there. So to quote um, another really nice article that sort of introduced this umbrella concept of proteoforms, these specific molecular forms are a complex and largely uncharted world of natural proteins. Uh, so that for me links when we think about things like the human protein atlas, the human cell atlas, um, and these different uh, large scale efforts, which are quite important and making good headway to hear the words uncharted world um, really uh, kind of piques my interest as well as others, certainly um, with thinking about how can we understand uh, not just the state, but also the role um, of these molecules that were these protein molecules that we're not really measuring at all in many cases, um, with the exception of a, of a tiny important handful. I guess the flip question of that is of those that we're not measuring, how many of them are important um, and we're not seeing them at all. So where I uh, really started with uh, this, again, as an engineer, as a measurement scientist, as an analytical chemist, um, I had a chance to spend part of my sabbatical uh, in a clinical lab a couple of years ago with Mark Pegram and Stephanie Jeffrey, visiting them um, periodically at Stanford, um, and really opened my eyes to how important some of these proteoforms are, not, not just in understanding, but also in clinical medicine. Uh, and this has formed the basis for um, several uh, projects. Um, that we've pursued and are currently pursuing. And this is around questions of oncoproteins and the role that different proteoforms of those oncoproteins play. So again, I am gonna use this time with you to deep dive into specific questions and measurement systems um, with the hopes that uh, we'll uh, pique uh, some interest in you and maybe the tools or approaches that you're developing and you can help us, um, not just me, but our field uh, tackle these problems. So cut to the chase. The example that I'm going to use today is the ERB2 protein. This protein is also known as a HER2 protein. It is a transmembrane protein. So if this is the membrane of the cell, we expect uh, HER2 to span that membrane. There's two important domains for the purposes of today's discussion. One is the extra cellular domain, and the second is an intracellular tyrosine kinase domain. This protein is large. It's about 185 kilodons. There's really two important things to take away today about the HER2 protein and then an implication. Uh, and the first important thing is this extracellular domain of this 185 kilodalton protein was the very first uh, protein domain that was targeted by the first FDA approved targeted cancer therapy. So when we're thinking about uh, moving away from chemotherapy and radiation therapy or augmenting those with a targeted therapy, trastuzumab, trastuzumab a humanized monoclonal antibody fit the bill, uh, also known as Herceptin, in terms of being able to target that extracellular domain of HER2, which is oftentimes dramatically overexpressed on cancer cells. In addition to understanding the clinical function of this transmembrane protein in the extracellular domain, I want to draw your attention to the fact that 
her, even this HER2 protein um, exists not as a single molecular form, but as an entire family of molecular forms. And th this is actually quite common. Um, and so we see what are called truncated isoforms of HER2 playing roles in cancer biology. Um, and we have truncated isoforms that span from 110 kilodaltons or so. So they're called truncated because they're missing that 75 uh, kilodalton extracellular domain region out here. Um, and also forms, so even more truncated forms that exist on the membrane, in the cytosol, and also even in the nucleus of the cell. So the second important thing to take away from this little case study on the HER2 um, transmembrane protein is not just the fact that the extracellular domain is important clinically and therapeutically, but that an entire uh, set of the family, an entire portion of the family of HER2 actually lacks that extracellular domain. And so clinically, that means if we have HER2 expressed in a cell, and we know that that is helpful, but we have to understand what form of HER2 is expressed because if, instead of being the, the transmembrane full length protein, the form is a truncated isoform. The use of trastuzumab against the cells that are overexpressing the truncated forms of HER2 will not be effective. And so this for me really drives home the importance in a very uh, uh, specific clinical example um, with treatment regimen decisions um, being based on, again, this targeted cancer therapy or, or, or not using that particular therapy. So an example there. Um, just a little bit of benchmarking. Uh, so as an engineer, this is something we like to do to understand what is out there um, and where we can fill important gaps. You probably, regardless of your field, also do this as well. Um, so I mentioned these unmapped areas in our Atlas of Biology and Disease. Of course, sequencing uh, suffice to say when we think about proteins, um, typically not able to reflect the dynamic state of proteins, either expression modification and complexing, uh, which is something that I think is, is another very important area of these protein, protein, and other large scale interactions. In addition to that mass, mass spectrometry, a powerful suite of tools that exist um, right now with the eye towards single cell direct measurement of proteoforms, these tools are currently stymied by limits of detection, limited throughput, and then the fact that most of mass spectrometry advances that are inching us towards or have gotten us to single cell resolution are methodologies that require digestion of the proteins prior to analysis. So thinking about how to do instead of bottom up, top down mass spec um, to be able to re retain the stoichiometry that is so important to understanding not just the presence of particular modifications or proteoform components, but the actual stoichiometry of what that molecular family looks like in a particular question of interest. And then lastly, uh, the amino assay, of course, flow cytometry, mass cytometry, and other amino assays that are out there. We know um, that there are challenges around the selectivity. I've definitely highlighted that today with regards to proteoforms and this 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9th targets that we're just completely blind to because we don't have the measurement capabilities at the single cell level. Um, and then, of course, uh, confounding issues regarding really trying to pull out that signal when you're thinking of multiplexing immunoassays, especially at the single cell level, um, attributable primarily to chemical fixation. And then, as I mentioned, the targeted multiplexing. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the types of problems that we work on, uh, de designing and developing new tools, why we're working on them in terms of implica implications, so kind of a big picture framework, and then also a little bit of uh, mapping here in terms of what the landscape of existing tools looks like. So the approaches that we've been uh, using based on our expertise and areas that we think separation science in particular could augment uh, uh, some of the, the tools that we just talked about really are around compartmentalizing, so isolating, manipulating individual cells or small groups of cells. You're probably familiar with some of the powerful droplet-based systems, certainly microchambers, and in our case, microwells are other um, approaches to compartmentalization that have specific uh, strengths and weaknesses with respect to that design of the measurement tool and the question at hand. We typically couple those isolation strategies Again, in our case today, I'll talk about microwell arrays with separation mechanisms that can really start to tease out selectively specific physicochemical properties 
of the molecule of interest. And so you can, you can start to understand why separation would help us peer into this uh, vast uncharted wilderness of proteoform expression. And then lastly, the tools I'll talk about today concatenate this upstream separation stage. So for that fine measurement of the physical chemical property of interest with an immunoassay, a back-end immunoprobing uh, step. So many of you have probably used Western blots. Of course, there's a whole suite of immunoblot tools that are out there that can be tailored uh, to the specific, again, physical question, chemical question of interest. Um, and the tools that we've uh, been developing, designing and developing using microfluid design approaches um, really look to harness these immunoblotting multi-stage assays to do one thing. And that's really to measure our targets of interest with a selectivity that goes beyond that possible by an immunoassay alone. And that's the key at the end of the day, what we're working to do is to confer that additional selectivity over the immunoassay. And that's because we're interested in proteoforms. So to do this, we use uh, microfluidic design and the physics of diffusion uh, and convective flow uh, to be able to control chemistry in space and time. Um, and I'll introduce you to a couple of specific examples now. Uh, so the, the past several years, we've de developed, a, again, a suite of measurement, molecular measurement tools that are based, again, on these separations types approaches, drawing from single cell samples, um, all using a very similar chassis. Uh, so that's a, a, an open microfluidic design. And I'll walk you through what that means and why we think that's important and opens up new measurement opportunities. So how do these assays work? Uh, these single cell immunoblots, again, to confer that higher molecular specificity. Isolation of an individual cell. So a cartoon here, you're just looking down on a cell nestled in a microwell. Um, being able to address those microwells with the upstream sample preparation chemistries and conditions of interest. Uh, of course, in measurement science, those upstream conditions for sample prep are absolutely critical. Uh, I think in computer science, we like to say junk in, junk out. Um, and so that's something that we're very aware of in terms of uh, really trying to control in a reproducible and known way how we prepare the molecules molecules that we're interested in measuring downstream, um, so that we're not inadvertently measuring um, lots of artifacts. And you probably know from uh, some of the work that's been done over the past several years around what sometimes is referred to as a reproducibility crisis in science. Um, you know, there's many aspects to that, which I think is a little bit of an overblown statement, um, but one of which certainly is the reliable uh, use of immunoreagents, including antibodies. How do you validate those? How do you quality control those? And how do you make sure that you're using them in the way that you think you're using them? And I'm happy to talk about that in the questions. Um, I've had a chance to serve on a working group, a workshop with the NIH around that topic. But a second element beyond the uh, use and inadvertent misuse of immunoreagents is this upstream sample prep and how you control your sample before you make the measurement. So long story short, um, um, we're able to control uh, that upstream sample uh, handling uh, and then essentially perform a separation. For us, we're pretty interested in electrophoretic uh, mechanisms of separation. So size-based um, native separations, um, isoelectric focusing, um, and some other separation mechanisms that essentially drive the now solubilized targets of interest into uh, this region of our device that surrounds the microwell. Um, the work I'm gonna describe to you today uses a polyacrylamide gel. There's a little bit something different about the gel um, than the gels that you use in slab gel systems. But for all intents and purposes, this is a phenomenal molecular sieving matrix for proteins and molecules of similar sizes um, under electrophoretic conditions. So the solubilized protein migrates through the wall of the microwell and, and each of the species start to resolve based upon differences in, in whatever physical chemical property the assay has been designed to resolve those targets based on. So size is an example that's given here. But polyacrylamide is also a nice material because it's a great structural material uh, for us to be able to create these compartments um, and do that upstream sample handling. The second aspect is uh, uh, leading us towards that final stage of the assay. So a separation step, we've got our molecular sieving matrix or electrophoretic mechanisms of interest. We want to get to the amino assay. Um, so what we need to be able to do is essentially toggle between what is a homogeneous system. So that means we've got protein targets that are floating uh, in the hydro 
a part of the hydrogel. Uh, so in the liquid filled pores of that polyacrylamide uh, gel network, what we need to do is take those molecules that are in solution and uh, attach them uh, to a surface. So that makes the homogeneous system into a heterogeneous system, which allows us to then uh, perform immunoassays on those now immobilized species. Uh, and so for us, we've used some photoactive chemistries. The one I'll mention today is benzophenone. We incorporate benzophenone into the polyacrylamide matrix by using a synthesized benzophenone methacrylamide uh, monomer that incorporates during fabrication. After we've completed the separation, we can just basically shine UV light on this hydrogel and covalently attach our targets to the polyacrylamide gel, so a 3D matrix, um, which allows us to probe in this final immunoassay step. So hopefully that makes sense. The data I'm going to describe in a couple of minutes is all really predicated on your understanding that, um, which of course has nice analogy to some of the things that we do with macroscale separations. This is what one of our devices looks like. This is a glass microscope slide. This is an isometric view that you're taking a look at here. Um, that thin layer of polyacrylamide gel that I mentioned, which allows us to form the micro well array, each of which houses an individual cell. Um, and then, of course, really important, abutting each of those micro wells is the separation lane that's where we perform the readout of the, of the protein targets of interest. So hundreds to thousands of micro wells on each of these open devices. You'll notice that in our case, we're not using any microchannels, microchambers, pneumatics, meaning pumps or valves. The entire system, uh, in terms of the uh, manipulation and handling, um, is really done at a bulk scale. So bulk exposure of UV light to the system, uh, two electrodes to run the thousands of separations in parallel. There's no fine uh, sort of micro machine detail electrodes or what have you. And we did that purposefully because we're pretty interested in translation. Uh, for the six uh, previous years uh, before COVID, we've had the chance to teach a hands-on course at Cold Spring Harbor Lab, so taught nearly 200 um, biolo biologists and clinicians how to uh, fabricate, use, and analyze data that come from systems like this, and, and having the devices be very similar to a basically just a, a microscope slide is uh, really helpful in translating the tools out of our labs and into the world. So that gives you a view of the device. To quickly give you a view of what this device chassis, this kind of general open microfluidic framework looks like, I'll just zoom into the endpoint um, of a single cell immunoblot example. This is one block um, of the microwells that you saw just a moment ago. So here's bright field of the cells um, uh, in compartmentalized in those microwells. And then after uh, lysis solubilization and completing the multi-stage assay that I just described to you, in the region abutting the micro well, you can see the readout uh, for the high selectivity immunoblot. Um, I wanna draw your attention to the fact that the lysis and separation stage uh, combined takes less than a minute. So very, very fast electrophoresis, um, especially if you're used to using capillary or slab gel-based systems on the macro scale. And then really um, dovetailing with that here, the separation distances we use are about 500 microns, so about five diameters of a human hair um, or a millimeter or so in length. So tiny, tiny, tiny separation distances as compared to those uh, slab gel based systems that we're familiar with, um, with macro scale samples. So separation st science standpoint, we can do um, perform Gaussian fitting to be able to estimate the abundance or expression level of a target of interest as well as the molecular mass. Um, and that's important for some of the work that we've been um, digging into regarding protein complex um, uh, expression as well. And to circle back, um, I wanted to complete kind of this case study that I presented in the beginning around this question of the HER2 truncated isoforms and full length protein expression, again, at the individual cell level. And I just have three examples here to just make the point that these tools can bring the selectivity that's needed to profile uh, and map the truncated uh, isoforms. So here we have a cell that is expressing or had a cell that was expressing uh, this uh, full length protein. And so the cell, uh, this is the micro well. At the end of the separation, you see a readout from an antibody fluorescently labeled uh, 
primary and then a fluorescently labeled secondary antibody that tell you that yes, the full length P185 HER2 was present. Uh, we have some engineered CHO cells, one that expresses full length. So you can see, yes, full length protein is present. And then one that's been engineered to express both full length and that important P110 truncated isoform. So smaller species. That species is electromigrated into the gel further because it makes its way through that molecular sieving matrix more easily than the large species. Um, and we can read out, again, the stoichiometry of expression for those targets in this cell that I'm giving as an example. The last point I'll make on this uh, micrograph uh, is that we are able to detect both of those isoforms using the same antibody. So this antibody, and you can tell by the, the false color signal, detects both of those species the way that we're able to distinguish between the two species is the fact that we've had that separation stage to, to, to resolve those species based upon differences here in molecular mass. So that kind of completes the story um, as regards to why would you ever be interested in performing an immunoblot on a single cell um, with that example. The uh, tools that we described, I mentioned our translation interest. Um, we've had a chance to apply them to a couple of different systems. An area that's really a sweet spot for us are looking at scarce clinical samples. Um, so when we don't have you know, suspension of cells available, of course, typically we do start with the cell line so that we can uh, develop and validate the measurements that we're making. Um, but we uh, found that there's very few tools that allow this sort of specificity, especially for scarce populations. And one example that we published on a couple of years ago now with Stephanie Jeffrey, um, is around this putative circulating tumor cells. So this is just a profile of a single circulating tumor cell or a group, I'm sorry, of circulating tumor cells with single CTC resolution. Um, and our question here has really been looking at what does the protein expression profile in a CTC, putative CTC, look like as compared to the solid originating tumor? Um, and so some of that work has been published and some is ongoing. Uh, I mentioned that oncoproteins in general um, are susceptible to these truncated isoforms. Many other proteins are as well. And um, estrogen receptor is another target with ER positive cancers that we've um, been working on for some time and then looking at um, how can we extend these types of assays to complement a clinical standard in pathology, which is the immunohistochemistry measurements that are made and scoring that's used to indicate the grade of cancer. And so this is just one of our, uh, to remind me to mention uh, that we've embarked on clinical studies in or, or I should say pilot studies, not large scale clinical trials, but pilot clinical studies looking at uh, breast cancer uh, across biospecimens um, that have also been subjected to IHC to see where the specificity adds useful information. I think I have a couple, a uh, bit of time left and I um, wanted to highlight really two areas. Um, the first one uh, kind of showing not, not with a clinical um, bent, but with a fundamental biology bent, where some of these scarce cell measurements can make a difference. And I have just a couple of slides on this, but I wanted to give you a kind of a taste for, for what we've been looking at and also some multi-mode measurements um, that we're building around these types of tools and questions. So this uh, work was a collaboration with a, just a whole range of excellent researchers, engineers, and scientists um, at UC Berkeley, um, including Lynn He, who's my colleague in at HHMI and also um, UC Berkeley's molecular and cell biology department. Um, we really, you know, just basically met at a poster session on campus and uh, her postdoc and my graduate students started talking and realized that there's just a huge unknown um, at the very, very early stages of pre-implantation embryo development here in a mouse model. Um, and those unknowns really have to do with questions of early lineage bias for the blastomeres that comprise those early embryos versus what levels of flexibility or plasticity those individual blastomeres maintain. So at what stage in embryonic development do we expect each of the blastomeres that are comprising the embryo um, to make a decision 
about what that cell is going to become. Um, trophectoderm or inner cell mass are kind of the two earliest um, decisions that are made. And so just schematically here, if you're not a developmental biologist, or if you are, um, feel free to chime in. But we started by looking at the very earliest stage, so two cell, again, pre-implantation mouse embryo versus the next stage, the four cell. Uh, and so in each of those, you can see that the pair, the sister blastomeres, and then moving to the four blastomeres. So our question is, specifically with one, starting with one protein target, this GAD-D45A, do we expect to see uh, uniform expression of GAD-D45A among the two cells at the two cell stage, or do we expect some asymmetry, meaning that one of those cells has started uh, choosing a lineage um, uh, path to develop along uh, in the subsequent stages of development? And we also ask the question at the four cell stage. So when two versus four cell or even later and where? And of course, there is uh, transcriptional data out there um, that gives a little bit of insight and um, suggests when that decision is made. Um, but for us, we wanted to get right to the heart of it and look directly at the protein um, target of interest. And so the first uh, question was around the four cell blastomere. What about this heterogeneity in the GAD-D45A expression? So essentially took the four cell mouse embryo, um, pre prepared that embryo very carefully to be able to dissociate each of the four blastomeres, of course, that comprise, comprise the four cell embryo, and then performed this high specificity direct protein analysis on each of those uh, blastomere targets. And so you can see micrographs here, they are false color micrographs um, that have been contrast adjusted for visual presentation but we have two housekeeping proteins we're, we're taking a look at, and then the GAD-D45A. We're able to then analyze um, the expression of each of the, the housekeeping proteins in the GAD-D45A across the two four cell embryos that I'm, I'm showing here, normalize that expression, and then essentially say the expression of GAD-D45A, statistically speaking, uh, and that's another nice element of being able to do a separation type analysis is we, we can say something about the abundance of, of the protein in each of those starting samples. Statistically speaking, we do see higher variability in the GAD-D45A as compared to the housekeeping proteins across those four cells. So the working answer right now is yes, at the four cell level, we do see heterogeneity in that uh, protein expression. We've looked at other proteins as, that are specific um, to this development mechanism as well. Um, but just in this example, to kind of show you the power of the tool, we do see that heterogeneity. Whereas at the two cell stage, using the same um, approach, of course, and the same sorts of comparison between the expression level and the variation in the expression level, again, compared to a control, um, something that we expect not to vary among the blastomeres, which are these, we use two housekeeping proteins um, to be able to capture that. At the two cell level, we are not seeing this uh, sort of lineage, uh, potential lineage selection from each of those blastomeres. So there is still uh, the working conclusion, plasticity at the two cell stage here. Um, and so that's, that really led us to uh, be quite excited about being able to dig in and make these direct protein measurements. Um, the recent work that we published on this particular study is highlighted here at the bottom. Uh, it also includes other targets that are more specific to some of the developmental biology um, and also um, additional embryonic development stages as well, including all the way up to some of the more mature pre-implantation stages, um, which have a pretty strong sensitivity to sample selection, and then being able to tie in the location of each of the cells, so hundreds of cells um, to position within um, that developing pre-implantation embryo. So I don't have time to go through that today, and I just wanna draw your attention to that element. And I think I have a couple of more minutes. Um, I'll just kind of finish with a forward looking sort of where we're going um, with these types of tools and thinking about them for multi-mode, but again, precision analysis. So at the level of a scarce starting population of cells, in the case of the two cell embryo, of course, starting with just two dissociated blastomeres. So loss of each of, of either of those sample um, specimens is catastrophic to the measurement. Uh, so being able to handle, manipulate, and then analyze each of those cells and index back to the starting embryo um, that we began with are important considerations for the precision. 
This uh, system we have adapted and advanced um, to be able to also tie together measurements of the protein um, expression and the proteoform expression in each of the starting cells with downstream measurements of uh, both DNA and the mRNA as well. Uh, so in this particular example, I'll show you today one of our early um, platforms, which has evolved since our uh, recent publication of this work, um, that essentially uses the separation system, so the micro well, to isolate again the individual cells, allow us to uh, solubilize the cellular membrane while keeping the nucleus intact. Uh, so this is something that is known as differential detergent fractionation. So I promised you an emphasis on engineering and chemistry here. Um, using a system of detergents, that outer cell membrane is um, solubilized and we're able to analyze the cytoplasmic fraction of proteins while keeping the nuclei intact or the nucleus intact if it's a one cell system and continue um, the measurements there. So here is a false color micrograph of an intact uh, mammalian cell. The nucleus here is stained in blue. The cell itself is expressing green fluorescent proteins. You can see that halo of green in the cytoplasmic portion. Um, how this works is we apply a specific detergent that solubilizes the outer membrane. You can potentially see the inner, this nucleus that is intact in the micro well. Well, we've been able to analyze the protein content using an immunoblot and then subsequently apply a second detergent system that solubilizes the nuclear membrane and then allows for measurement of the protein content of the nucleus. We've chosen here to use something that we call bidirectional electrophoresis. So we're able to segment the uh, cytoplasmic compartment to the right of the micro well in this example and the nuclear compartment to the left of the micro well so that we don't have to use sort of any image segmentation or analysis, which can sometimes be um, subjective in terms of assigning a location, uh, um, an intracellular location to a protein target of interest. Instead of using imaging to do the assignment, we use the chemistry um, to do the assignment of the protein to a particular subcellular compartment. Here, the nucleus versus the cytoplasmic compartment. Uh, uh, if you're interested more in uh, using chemistry to segment uh, the compartments of an individual cell and look at the protein expression in each of those, uh, we have a, a couple of publications I would direct you to um, and uh, have validated that using a series of systems, including this nuclear translation uh, translocation of NF kappa B as well over time. To apply the chemistry, um, our ethos has really been around not using you know, large scale pneumatics, uh, tiny pumps and valves, and just highly instrumented systems, but instead to try to use some of the properties of uh, materials, um, both diffusion in terms of transport, but also the partitioning coefficient and the very, very, the ability to tune the partitioning coefficient of hydrogels. And so I just wanted to include an example here to show you what the systems that I've just described look like. So a microscope slide that has the active region uh, where we isolate and sample prep those individual cells and then perform the separations and the uh, downstream, downstream probing. These two bars are electrodes that allow us to energize the system to be able to perform the separations. Um, the chemistry is either encoded in the hydrogel itself, the surrounding medium, and when we want to pattern that chemistry in space and in time, uh, one of the first systems that we developed uh, to do this is a just, again, a macro scale system that allows for micro scale precision. And that is a patterned hydrogel. So the hydrogel itself is patterned with the chemistries that we're interested in addressing um, the cells that are on and the separations that are on the microchip kind of in a local location dependent um, manner. So for us, that means applying something like this hydrogel sticker that has different regions that are imbued with different detergents and different buffer chemistries, and then allow diffusion um, to take over and to introduce the, the chemistries themselves to the cells or the separations that are inside this bottom hydrogel material. So it's actually been a pretty powerful approach while being quite simple, um, which is one of our design goals for sure, as regards translation in particular. And so this is um, an alumna of my research group, Elaine. She's just laying down the chemistry on top of the uh, immunoblot device to allow her to, uh, again, control what's happening in the sample prep or the separation stage. And that's how simple that is.
Um, one last thing I'll say in terms of the separation stage, I've highlighted a little bit our work with uh, size-based separations, certainly for the truncated isoform example with the 75 kilodalton difference in molecular mass that's uh, a well-suited separation. In some cases, some of the physical chemical properties we're interested in discerning are not so large. Um, and so we have also um, developed a suite of other separation mechanisms, including adapting isoelectric focusing to single cell systems. You can see our micro well right here, um, huh? which has allowed us to resolve species uh, down, down to targets that have just one charge difference between each of those isoforms. So 0.5% or smaller mass differences. Um, and that's a couple of hundred Daltons in difference. So the specificity in the molecular measurement um, is really highlighted there. And lastly, I'll just finish up by saying uh, the multimodal measurements, again, adapted for scarce samples in particular, after completing the separation, being able to pull out the information that we want about the protein uh, uh, targets of interest, then extracting, in our case, we call this a little gel palette that contains the nuclei or the nucleus and subjecting that uh, indexed nucleus to downstream analysis. So the example here um, in this work that was uh, just published recently, the example that we're showing is PCR and RTQ-PCR um, with DNA and mRNA. So I'll just finish by showing a highlight from two cell, four cell and blastocyst. So this much later stage of pre-implantation development, tying together the protein expression uh, for a specific target of interest and then extraction of the gel palette uh, to be able to look at the correlation or the relationship between the expression, the direct expression of the protein, and then also in this case, um, the PCR, QT, RTQ-PCR results respectively, which I, I think leads us to um, questions about same cell multimodal. So being able to tie together different molecular modes of information flow uh, from that same starting sample. So with that, I think I will conclude and say today I've chosen just a couple of examples and really try to dig into some of the chemistry uh, and engineering design elements um, to be able to get us to this uh, uh, unmapped land, if you will, of protein isoforms in particular to augment um, some of the powerful work that's happening on targets that are perhaps more visible um, using either sequencing technologies or immunoassays alone. With that, I wanna thank my research group for sure, our collaborators, uh, patients who uh, generously donated some of the specimens I highlighted today, as well as our funding sources um, and the organizers of this meeting for your time. Thank you. Amy. Uh, Raja says, great talk. Could you comment on the possibility to measure PTM occupancy, like HER2 phosphorylation occupancy at a single cell level by immunoblotting? Yeah, that's a great question. That, that, uh, thanks for that observation. That is, I would say, um, you know, I don't know if it's hyperbole to say it's a holy grail, um, but it is definitely a uh, goal of these types of tools. The data that I showed you on the single charge unit differences, and in that case, it was GFP that was expressed in a million cells, so a pretty well-controlled system. We use isoelectric focusing, single cell isoelectric focusing, followed by immunoassay to do that. That does point to the capacity of being able to measure something like single um, phosphorylation differences between molecules. So we have not done that yet. And I think your goal there, of course, is uh, a really important one. And I think it is within reach, again, because of the specificity um, of the detection stage. OK, great. So Herbert asks, how are single cells deposited in individual wells? Is there a doublet issue? Oh, yeah. OK, yeah. I. I um, uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's Poisson statistics, just like any compartmentalization approach. So if you may be a little bit more familiar with the droplet based approaches, you know that um, you can design the size and the frequency, the suspension, um, uh, you know, the density of the suspension as well to kind of drive you towards single cell per droplet occupancy. It's the exact same thing with a micro well based system. Um, just like a droplet, our micro wells get full so they can be overloaded with cells. And just like a droplet, you can have an empty compartment as well. So there's a little bit of differences there, but not no special physics at all. <laughs> it's just what you understand. So yes, um, we have published a nature protocol that really outlines some design 
guidelines for how you can design your system to really push you towards single cell per micro well occupancy. And for the micro well system, it really comes down to the aspect ratio that you choose to use for your micro well compared to the size of the, the diameter of the mammalian cell or other cell that, excuse me, you're interested in. So nothing, nothing surprising there. We have um, in some of the scarce cell samples. So I mentioned the circulating tumor shells and I showed some of the data from the two cell pre-implantation embryos. So those two blastomeres for those types of analyses, because we have such small starting amounts of material, throughput isn't really a concern for us. Um, so handling cells individually is really no problem. Uh, so microtransfer pipetting is really helpful um, in those systems and uh, concatenated with imaging. And then lastly, we have developed some systems that use centrifugation. So instead of being micro wells in the device, they're along the walls of the device. And I think there's some maybe carnival rides that are like that. Um, and we can use centrifugation to populate those micro wells in a really active way. I didn't show that today. Thank you. Oh. Okay, great. Thanks, Amy. So we're at 3.30.